Okay. I'm Joe Sands from Miller Chemical, and this this is a very I've given the basis of this presentation before. Some of you have seen it, but I've added to it. I actually have learned some things, and uh, there's a lot of interesting going things going on. Miller has embarked on this program for health promoting products, and they actually work. And so we'll get into that. And you know, disease prevention, health promoting, stronger plants. And in my opinion, once we learn how to use these products, when to apply them, rates and all of that, it's going to take a couple of years. I believe these products will end up being at the heart of IPM. That's what IPM is all about. They're not fungicides, they're not insecticides. They're health promoting. Let's see if I can do this right. There we go. Um, I'm going to start out with Exit. A lot of you are familiar with Exit. It's an adjuvant. It's very active. When um, Bayer rolled down Movento, they trialed it with a number of different adjuvants, and they also trialed it by themselves, and they found that the highest percentage active ingredient in plants was when they applied it with Exit. Now, that's Bayer's research, not ours. It's a very good product. Using it properly can really help. The reason why I mention that is we use the same type of technology in our full referral, and they work. Um, they're called Nutrient Express products. Transcuticular delivery system, highly mobile. Um, Movento is marketed as being ambi-mobile. We don't market Exit as being ambi-mobile, but if it's, it's working so, with, uh, so well with, uh, with Movento, it stands to reason that it is ambi so it's a very good series of products. The Miller Dual Foss products are both um, Nutrient Express products. There's Greenstem and Fertigard. I've done a lot of trials recently with Fertigard in the middle of doing a very large cotton trial in Blythe. And uh, it looks very interesting. So far, we'll get to that. And obviously, we're time, right time, right place, right rate, right source. Um, We've had some really good results for Pertigo. We don't always know why, but it has to do with timing. There's no question it has to do with timing. Um, one of the main things and is that these products, you know, they have natural betaines, which are abiotic stress mitigants, especially against heat. That's why Michael Rethwich was so interested in trialing um, this line of products with cotton up and white. So far, the results have been good. We're not going to the trial. There's things we have to do differently next year. But the products look good. They look like they're really working. And uh, what they do is they uh, induce the rapid production of a plant's own phytoalexis, which is its own natural ability to fight off diseases, natural disease resistance, systemic disease resistance. It is also the um, Fertigard and Greenstem are dual FOSS products, it means they have phosphorus and now, these are some of the phosphite products that are on the market. They're sold as fungicides. Uh, our products are not fungicides. We don't market them as fungicides. We don't market them as health promoters. Very key. Aluminum phosphite, Aliet, and Reliant is a mono dipotassium salt of phosphorus acid. Phosphorus acid is phosphorus. Abiotic stress mitigation. Um, the abiotic stress we get around here is heat. Especially you look at cotton growing up in blight, it's going to hit 115 degrees this week. Uh, really high night temperatures is the main problem. But every crop at some point or other in this area will be affected by heat. You know, if, if it grows away from December and January, you're going to get heat. Heat is really too much for what that product should be getting. And these products will help you mitigate the effect. Just tells you what it's got in it, betaines, vitamins, phosphite, synergism with uh, phosphoric acid. I believe that's true. We've seen it. I like this product better than our 44127. It seems to be more active. Express technology, that's basically our related to uh, exit. And this to me is, you know, something I've been looking into recently, and I don't really know a whole lot about it. I mean, we have all got this in school at some point. But if you look at, and this is going to be related to some fungicides that are on the market, um, there are antagonism and stimulation with them. In other words, if, for example, you apply zinc, well, you're going to antagonize iron uptake, you're going to antagonize phosphorus uptake, and also their effects, they block the effect that it actually has. Um, calcium, the same thing. And you go around, you know, magnesium, 
It can affect your potassium uptake. It can also affect some other things. And I really want to look at this manganese, iron uptake, um, calcium uptake, copper. And why do I mention this? Well, preventive fungicides, some of them are made from micronutrients. Manganese, zinc, and copper. What's mancozeb? Does anybody remember what mancozeb is? Yeah, no. Really obvious. What's mancozeb? What is it? It's 50, mancozeb is 15% manganese, and, and I think 1.9% zinc, which is micronutrients. But what happens? I don't know that this happens, but it makes sense. If you're adding that much man manganese, and the rates are fairly high, they're telling you to put in a fair amount on it, you may be blocking your iron. In fact, you probably are affecting your iron uptake, affecting your calcium uptake, affecting your copper uptake. You're antagonizing. You have to be, at least to a certain extent, and maybe to a minor extent, which you are doing. And the same thing goes with copper. Now, get the copper right. I've gotten into this a little bit late, but there are some citrus growers that use copper as a fungicide. And I'm not going to talk about the products yet because I don't know enough about it. Some of these copper products have a lot of copper in it. So you should be affecting your iron and your phosphorus and your manganese up there. All right. Um, in the lettuce recommendation that I found, you're applying from 2.24 to 0.3 pounds per acre. When the manganese content in lettuce is puny, so you are affected. If it's getting into the plant like it should, you are affected. So we're looking at Fertigar 24127 plus ZMC Express. Fertigar is a Nutrient Express product. It's a dual cost product. <laughs> It's also got some micronutrients in it, and we got and I'm looking at CMC Express. This is CMC Express. It's got 1.8 mang percent manganese, 3.7 percent zinc. It's not even close to manganese. Is it going to replace a fungicide? Of course not. That isn't our idea. But it stands to reason, and we're trialing it with this in you know in mind. It stands to reason that that plus the dual plus product should have a strong effect in preventing fungal diseases, diseases in general, because it is uh, affecting and is improving your plant's phytoalexins. I have a problem. Phytoalexins is just this ability to fight off disease, all diseases. But it's been proven to work with fungi and OMICs, which are not fungal. There were fungi 40 years ago when I went to school, but they're not fungi anymore. So we learned. Um, with CMC Express, you're adding a very small amount of manganese and a very small amount of zinc. But it's a balanced micronutrient package. We designed our micronutrients to be balanced so that you don't get the antagonism that you do with applying one micronutrient at a time. And for years and years, people that I they still do it, they have the same deficiency, they go out and put zinc on it. Well, you're creating some antagonism. Why not? And we saw, we don't sell that much CMC Express, we saw a lot of micro. But I'm putting ZMC Express on here because I think it's a good example when it's compared to nitrogen. Not a comparison, but when you look at it next to nitrogen. And, um, and we, do, we do sell ZMC Express in other parts of the country. I saw a lot of it in Colorado, for example. And, uh, but uh, Microplex is higher in copper. Now, I don't have that on the charts. And I, don't have a, you know, I don't have a chart for it. I don't have a slide for it. Um, I haven't really gotten that far, but I'm going to start looking into it. I'm working with some people to find some proper products on citrus, and we're going to look and see what we can do. Um, this is a first A story. I didn't take these pictures, but on the right is where we applied green stuff. I'm trying to promote uh, Fertigard more. I, I like it. To me, it's more versatile, but they're both very similar to each other. One is essentially a liquid version of the other. You can see the color difference. Right there. And I promise I didn't take these from uh, Arizona Extension. Mm -hmm. Just a few minutes ago. But no, they're different pictures. These are taken up in Salinas. But they do have an impact. Um, downy mildew lesions, AN20, 7.33 per plant. Miller program with green stem, 1.33 downy mildew lesions per plant. It does work. And a lot of you have seen this, these are kind of, 
you know, these are on, on a rose bush I've got. I don't, I, 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 it is visual. You can see the downy mildew. I applied it. I applied um, green stem on it. And it solved the problem to a large extent. It didn't get rid of it, but it helped it a lot. And then the problem came back, which told me if the environment didn't change. It really did solve the problem, but you have to keep doing it. I had to keep putting it on, and I did. So the plant deteriorated a lot over time. But anyway, um, that's pretty much it. The end. Okay, so our next speaker, he's working out of the Yuma Ag Center here, a uh, local guy, uh, Marco Pena. I'm sure you all know him. He's been around here for a while now. How many years? I can't remember. Can't remember. Five. Five. 19, 20, 20, 92, since 20. 1992. Is this? a long time. Uh, so we're going to use this one here. Uh, so uh, he's a weed scientist, a weed specialist, um, and today he's going to talk to us about herbicide resistance in weeds of the low desert. So take it away. Yeah. Just go so, ahead and scroll it up and down. OK. Yeah. Uh, first, I wanted to let you know we have this little publication there in the, in the front. If you guys want to get one, great. It's uh, for weed seedling identification. There's a lot of publications for to identify mature plants. And uh, the idea was to have a, have a little publication with seedlings the earlier you, you uh, identify your, your problem and spray it, the, the better chance to control them. Anyways, that's, it's available for you to, uh, to have a copy. And uh, we all have seen fields like this that, that shows. And we've been doing a, uh, we survey, we go like monthly across the Yuma County and uh, trying to evaluate the different populations, the weed populations, and uh, talk to some of the guys, some of you guys, uh, in all the way from Tacna to Dome Valley, you know, North Gila, all the way to the, the Yuma Mesa, you know. And uh, we have been, uh, oh, by the way, this, this may be one of the questions that uh, the, um, quiz, what are those surveys good for? We identify uh, hosts for diseases, for insects, and for weed management. So it's all of the above on that question. That, uh, that's the purpose of the surveys. And some guys are, are uh, saying that been having problems with pigweeds, hairy flea bane, shepherd spurs, which are the ones that I kind of going to cover because there's not a lot of time. Horse weeds, fine crest, hood canary grass, and clover, malva. Sometimes we've been putting a, for a long time one, one product, and now they say we cannot control them with, this, with the same rates, the same herbicides. So that's classical uh, definition of resistance. And uh, according to, to some of the, some, what, what we've been talking, resistance. It's when weed species, once susceptible to certain herbicides, now escape control. As an example, pigweed and glyphosate. There's, there's, uh, this, it is documented in our state, and, and uh, we'll, we'll show you, I'll show you later on some images from, from fields, Yuma fields, and the rates that we've been applying, and, and, uh, and uh, what's been happening and, and with those applications. We use interchangeably sometimes the term resistance and tolerance and inconsistently. But tolerance is when uh, you have a plant that you have never been able to kill with some herbicide, it's, it's tolerant. You have never been able to kill with certain herbicides. As an example, atrazine doesn't do anything to corn. It's uh, tolerant. It's an in inherently capacity of the plant. It didn't develop through a process of many years. It's just something that it, it has it in, in, in the genetics. And uh, regarding resistance, there's this couple of theories. There's probably more than that, but I just wanted to point at this too. 
the gene pool theory that uh, proposes that uh, plants originally, they were all, I mean, susceptible. And then suddenly there was a mutation, a genetic change in the, in the, in the, in the plant, and then the mutation was favorable, and those plants uh, develop resistance and then multiply. That's one theory. And the other, the selection theory, is considered by most, most a lot of weed, weed guys are saying that that's, that's what happened, that uh, we had resistant biotypes. Some, some plants were resistant, and then we continue using one molecule, one mode of action, and then we continue killing the susceptible plants, and at the end we end up with a resistant population. And uh, for some people, it makes sense. It's like, uh, for example, uh, Miki, how, how, when was the last time you put an application of herbicides and you killed 100% of your weeds? Never. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's a, so you had some survivors. And this, this uh, theory, the selection theory, proposes that that's what's happening. Those individuals were resistant, but we continue using one mode of action, one, uh, one uh, chemical, and then we are killing our susceptible individuals, and we end up with a, a resistant population. And that's, that's kind of like this one shows right there. Uh, you see at the beginning, we have only a couple of uh, resistant individuals, and then we continue using one mode of action. It could be a different molecule, but it's the same mode of action. And then at the end, we end up with a resistant population, kill all the susceptible. That's the theory behind this. Wanted to show with that, the discharge only that uh, the uh, number of uh, cases is increasing. And this is in the US. And I highlighted those weeds. There are individual cases of resistance to glyphosate. Because those species, look, just uh, look, look at them. Hairy fleabane, horseweed, Johnson grass, Palmer amaranth, jungle rice, annual bluegrass, sprangle top, common, common sun, sunflower finger feather. All those species, we have them here. So it's a matter of our management. It, it, uh, to emphasize the fact that we need to uh, pay attention to our management, the weed resistance management. That is the point that I wanted to make with this, with this chart. And uh, I wanted to make a specific, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to make a specific reference to the, the triazine herbicides. Uh, as, as you know, well, this herbicides, like atrazine, metribucin, which is Sankor, we use a lot. This triazine binds to the, to the chloroplasts of the uh, cells. That's a cell, and those little dots are our chloroplasts in our cells. It's just a, I know it's a bad drawing, but that's what, wanted to show. And uh, the chloroplasts play a, an important role in photosynthesis, which is, as you know, how the plant synthesizes the food, the carbohydrate, those the sugars. So basically, if the triazines attach, bind to the uh, chloroplasts, photosynthesis doesn't happen. And what happens is that the plant dies of starvation. That's how this, this one particular site of action, that's what I wanted to illustrate. And of course, when you have a, a plant that the chloroplasts uh, are different or develop the capacity that the herbicides, in this case, the triazines cannot bind to the chloroplasts, the photosynthesis is not blocked, and therefore the plant functions normally. That's one specific point of action. That's what I was trying to illustrate. And there are other plants that uh, have a totally different uh, type of chloroplasts. So the uh, herbicides were never able to bind to that particular, uh, to, the chlor to the chloroplasts of the plant, and those plants are tolerant to our herbicides, to so that particular type of herbicides. And that's just one mode of, one mode of action, one site of action. And you, you have all those 30-some you know, mode, modes of action, like that guy is very pointing at. And uh, as you can see, oxygen transport inhibitors, the electron, that, there's so many, so many more that I can't even pronounce or understand. But uh, uh, that's what I wanted to show, that that's, that's the way resistance develops. Somebody illustrated that to me, like uh, when you have, uh, to, when you want to enter a building, there's one key, one lock. You have one, you need one key to get in. But if you have uh, 
let's say you have 100 locks in a door to get into a building. That's kind of like the plants, uh, the, the plants develop that kind of, the number of the ways into killing that plant are to multiply. So it is hard to get in to kill that plant because it develops certain, certain different uh, capacities. And it could be in any of those uh, sites of action or modes of action. And I think according to the international uh, weed resistant uh, database, 21 of those modes of action are, are being, uh, plants have developed resistance to 21 modes of action according to their database. Before we uh, say, okay, I got resistance in here, it's not just because I, my plants didn't die, not a few survivors. The point that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to make here is that we have to consider this environmental factors that affect weed control from the counterclockwise from, from the left. Let's say the, the pie is all your application, all your chemical. And then we could lose some herbicides via leaching Absorption, in other words, herbicide can be attached to the clay particles or organic matter and, and you lose it. It turns into vapor, volatilization, and we lose it. Chemical breakdown, sometimes you chemigate it and then it's with the acids it turns into, there's a chain reaction and your herbicide turns into something that's useless, so no herbicidal activity. Removal by plants, some plants absorb it and then metabolize it and we lose it. Photo degradation, of course, microbial activity. So we gotta rule out those factors before determining that we have resistance. Because if we're losing the herbicides, we, we cannot say that we're getting only that little orange section of herbicide, which is actually killing, uh, doing the, kill, the killing on your weeds. So once we ruled it out, I wanted to show you what happened. This is a field, all these pictures are Yuma. Everything is Yuma. This is here, Yuma, right now. I receive a plant, plants with uh, those plants in 714, I'll show you the case, 714 we received those plants that had two applications of 44 ounces of Roundup with AMS and NIS. Then, I said, okay, we'll go check it out and put a, I went back and replicated the application, I put 1X, 2X, and 3X of the same, the same product, plus whatever they sprayed. Then. I went back, right now I have, I've seen results in four or five days, I've seen symptoms on the plants. With, uh, with Roundup, with a good rate of Roundup, with this heat, I've seen it. But in this case, look at the five, four or five days, there's nothing. And then I go, wow. Then I came back to the lab right there and then I mixed more. I put a one X rate, a different date of course, and, and then I put an eight X, uh, eight X rate, same thing. Power Max, AMS, NIS. And three days after my application of a high, highest rate 8X, this is what I saw. You, you can see that there's already a, a symptoms on, on, on some of the plants. So the lower rates didn't kill absolutely nothing. And, and the higher rates, look at the plant right here in the, in the middle. So this three days, six days, started to, to, to die. And, uh, 13 days to see the final result, see what happened. Think the video is gonna work if I just scroll down? Okay. So as you can see right there, you, there's plants that look perfect, perfectly healthy and there's some dead plants, even pretty large plants, 8X application plus the, whatever they sprayed. And there's some others, there's different species. As, as you know, uh, Palmer amaranth can hybridize with red root pigweed or tumble pigweed. And on, on your right, you will see another plant that, is, that looks totally, totally healthy. And I, I think, I believe it is uh, red root pigweed right there, you see? So like we were showing in that, that chart earlier, a good, a dead individual with a healthy plant and a dead plant is, is in, the, in the whole field some survivors and, and some dead plants. And there's in a, a couple of miles from that field, there's, there's some other fields that, that have the beginning of it. It's just a matter of uh, documenting, I believe, in the, uh, using the correct protocol. You know what the, what the international committee asks 
uh, greenhouse evaluation, so many replications, and, and then register in the international weed resistant uh, database. So we're going to do that. I've been talking to uh, Dr. Carvalho from the Maricopa Agricultural Center. He got some seed, not from this because it's, it's not done, but we got seed from Shepherd's Purse, from uh, Harry Fleabane, and we're going to do those, those trials. And it is always good to know, to have documented what we have. And uh, this, this is what, what we've been working. He's got all the facilities. And I, was, I wanted to mention, like, this is a, this is a pigweed, palma amaranth seed. According to the U of A researchers, McCloskey and Blaze Evangel, the number of seeds that, that uh, uh, a female, because as you know, it's a dioecious plant. You need a female and a, and a male plant. A healthy female that it has grows with no competition can develop from 600 thousand to 1.6 million seeds per plant. So can you imagine that, that field that we just saw, the, the, the number of the seeds that we are developing, the, the seed bank that we have on the ground? And according to that guy, in 2007, documented that pollen can travel 28 miles. 28 miles, and, and, the, the, and the pollen can transmit the, uh, the gene of resistance. That pollen, that, gene of resistance can travel in the wind 28 miles. And uh, it's widely reported, as I mentioned, that palmer amaranth can cross-pollinate uh, red root pigweed or tumble pigweed. Since sometimes you see, they're, they're hard to describe sometimes. We see some, some plants that you think, well, what is this? You, know, you don't know if it is palmer or you get confused. The, the genetic variability that you have within this population is very big. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, again, with Dr. Carvalho and Marcopa, we're gonna be doing that with Shepherd's Purse and Harry Fleabane. This is Harry Fleabane. This has been sprayed with Roundup over and over, and we've been selecting. We've been killing the rest of the other weeds, and as you see, the field is covered with that particular weed, the majority. Of course, we got some other ones, like the one right there, but but the majority of the, of the wheat, it's, it, that's what's been happening. We did some trials and uh, we applied, uh, you know, for, for the purpose of uh, herbicide rotation, molecule rotation, we got this, uh, uh, we tried uh, glufosinate and uh, embed, and with two, application of, uh, two applications of Rely, uh, 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 we kept a really, we, we did a good job right there. You can see on the upper corner right there, but that, that killed, the, we kept it down. And embed extra is a, is a uh, is Jesse's right there, you can explain it's a 2,4-D formulation from Corteva that, th and this particular case, it didn't show um, phytotoxicity to the citrus. Right there on the skirt of the tree, didn't show any phytotoxicity to the citrus. I'm sure you're happy to hear that, but I know you know that, Jesse. But, uh, so, and I, I even finished, finished my trial and pulled out the flags and, and went back later, went back later and, and the thing was, oh, sorry. You know how the uh, plant growth regulators, immediately they show the epinasty on the plants, they bend down and they point it to the ground, but then they look kind of green. It looked like they're not gonna, they're, it wasn't working. And then, but it, it was really working after I pulled the flags. Later on, I stopped. And, and it was continue, it continued killing those, those weeds, those hairy flea veins. So that is an option, a rotation to avoid the over-reliance and round up, round up, round up. We, we, can, we can do that. We're looking for options. Another weed that we wanted to, we, that we sent seed to Maricopa to their greenhouses is Shepherd's Purse. A couple of locations out there in Welton, uh, we saw fields like this. This is an alfalfa field. It was covered 100% with uh, shepherd's spurs, and uh, it had been surviving the imidazolone herbicides uh, Raptor in Pursuit. So it went replicated, and we're doing some trials, and uh, we don't have time to show all the data, but uh, we put uh, Velpar, so a different herbicide, and it, it performed a little better. 
but we can we can continue doing some research and uh, I just wanted to let you know we're, we're going to be doing this, those evaluations because if we can document what we have available then if we need to apply for an SLN or a new a new tool we can say we don't have tools for controlling this we can we're asking we, we go to the IR4 project and apply for a new product and apply that, give that information to the EPA if we have it available. This is another one, swine crest, but this one, uh, there's two species, there's uh, Cornopus, Quamatus, and, and Didymus, but this is the one that's been, ha been having problems in California, and it's been reported here in Yuma that it survived dactyl, gold, tender, curb, prefar, uh, even solarization and they had problems in some irregular fields. So this is another one to pay attention to because uh, they've been having problems in, in, in uh, I know you, you guys in California. Another way that I wanted to mention is, uh, I don't know if you remember, in 2016 we, we uh, detected this and identified this new type of canary grass in our area. The usual canary grass that we see a lot is the one on the left, which is the uh, little seed canary grass, Polaris minor. And then the next one right there is hood canary grass, Phalaris paradoxa, that uh, can kill that thing. They put, in this field at the bottom, they put the well, curb, balen, prefar, those, those herbicides, they didn't do anything. And then uh, we went back to the, uh, to the other grass killers and uh, did several evaluations here at the farm and uh, in, the, in the field, in the growers field, and osprey. Osprey is the one that kills that. We found out, but it was it was too hot. It was I did some. Um, it was we had unacceptable injury to the lettuce. So if we can tweak the, the rates and try to try to adjust the rates, fine tune it, and uh, in case we need it, in case that propagates, because you know the birds go in there. If we, if we let it go to seed, we, get, we it can get transported everywhere. So that's another one. On the right, you see an, another one that looks a little bit different. That's uh, Phalaris canariensis. That, uh, that's another canary grass, but that one, can, we can still kill it. It's still susceptible to our, to our normal practice herbicides. White sweet clover. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that it's going to be in the, in, the, in the quiz about Palmer amaranth, that it's called the, the king of weeds because it reproduces so fast and it grows two to three inches a day, and, it, uh, and it's, it, it, uh, all those capabilities that adapt to different herbicides it produces a lot of res I mean, generates resistance really fast, according to that. So that, that's going to be on the, on the question. And this, uh, white sweet clover, they, they, glyphosate doesn't do anything to it. They, well, it does, it makes it look a little sick, but this is another field that it, was, it wasn't just this one row. It was the whole orchard covered like that. So we evaluated, we did some trials, we put uh, this growth regulator, uh, Clopirly, what is it, Sting Stinger? We put the 24 db 24, uh, 24 d from, uh, from uh, Corteva, and uh, it, was a, it was surprising for me that Suppress did, did really good. We had some, cl some clovers that went like probably three foot tall, 36 inches. And they bore the chlorophyll out of that. And the small ones, we killed some small ones, some, some seven, eight inches uh, clovers. So if we get them at the right stage, I believe that it's, it could be an option. But we, we were gonna continue doing evaluation, so I, I just wanted to mention that we need to rotate in order to avoid the resistance in, in the fact, in the in relation to the uh, pigweed, palm amaranth, I believe it was just only a matter of documenting it. We believe that it's here. You know, it's like the the flea bane. Every, uh, we as PCAs know that we we, we don't we don't put Roundup on it because it doesn't kill it, and it's not documented in an international weed resistant database that Arizona has it. So it's just a matter of documenting that we can work on that. And that's what we're going to be doing with Dr. Carvalho from Merco Bag Center. And Marco, can I ask a question? You, yes. you mentioned uh, 2,4-D choline plus clopyrrolid on clover. Did you by chance test 
Did you by chance test those alone? And, and alone. They were tested alone. Okay, so you're saying that both of them did equally well? And, and not on Clover didn't perform as well as uh, the 24D. Your 24D didn't perform as well on on Clover as it performed on Harry Felipe. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and on the on the Clover actually what happened is that the trial was still uh, I didn't get the full spectrum of control from from those herbicides because that. Our, our cooperator needed to clean the, the field, so I, I didn't get the full story. So that's, it, have, it has to be redone. So I think it, if we waited a little bit more time, we could have seen good results with, with, that, with those herbicides. And as you know, Malva, we cannot kill it with, uh, it just makes the uh, Roundup makes the uh, Malva look kind of a little bit sick, but it doesn't, doesn't do much. We're, uh, that's where I want to be. So the recommendations, we're going to continue with the wheat survey to do that, uh, those uh, evaluations of the populations, and on collect seed on pigweed, hairy flea vein, shepherd's spurs, and evaluate it in the greenhouse trials, and uh, document whatever is necessary with the, with the herbicide resistant committee there. And uh, of course, the recommendations are, right, like we always hear, change herbicide mode of action and change products. Uh, the use of pre-emergent herbicides, like for example, in this cotton right there, if we have done uh, a pre-emergence prowl, for example, we, the, the more weeds you kill pre-emergence is the less weeds you're gonna have to kill post-emergence. So it's better to put the pre-emergence herbicide. That's one recommendation. Uh, crop rotations, if we wanna hammer those pig weeds, if we have a grass type of crop, we can put all the broadleaf herbicides necessary to to avoid generating more seed from those uh, pigweeds. Tillage, Mark, Mark Siemens was talking about some new fingerweed cultivators and they're developing some technology in his shop right there. The agronomic management that we can do right now, if you go to Welton, you see a lot of germinating fields with uh, purslane. They, they just water it, germinate it, and then kill it before it goes to seed. Sanitation is, is a part of the recommendation. I know it's hard to, it's very dynamic and it's hard to go and power wash your equipment, but I remember I've done um, residue trials and you always go from the uh, clean treatment to the, uh, you've done uh, residue trials. You go from the clean treatment to the contaminated treatment. Simil similarly, we could leave the, f the field contaminated with, uh, with resistant weeds to the end. Start working on the, on, on the other fields and go to field one at the end because it's contaminated, it has a lot of, it's particular field like this one. And uh, generate more options like the IR4 uh, project that is going on right now for glufosinate for uh, spinach, lettuce, and cold crops. It's a burning you know, product before, before the crop. And let us know if we can be of any help. Just give us a call and we enjoy doing those evaluations. And uh, thank you for sharing your information with the university. And let us know if we can be of any help. Thank you. What I'd like to do is just give you a real quick review. This is more of a review than any new uh, pressing information, although I am going to show you some, some pretty cool stuff that we've been uh, collecting uh, over the last couple of years. But I'm going to focus on fall management, uh, particularly stand establishment, the early, probably the first September, October type issues. Uh, you know, most, many of you in this room participate in our uh, uh, insect lettuce insect losses surveys. We've been doing this since 2005. This year we put an 18-year summary uh, out there to collect, you know, what how important any of the our, our insects are. Um, you can see I've, I've highlighted the four of the more important insects in the fall, and there's some others obviously, and I've even cut this list off. But what I want to try to do is using some of this information we've collected 
to talk about specifically about some of these insects that are going to start popping up. Well, heck, they already are in the next uh, week or so as, as uh, the produce season really gets going. So that's, I'm going to use some of this data that it, we've, we've published it, but probably nobody's looked at it. Um, the other thing is I'm going to show some data from our area-wide trapping network. We've been doing this for, this will be the 10th year, consecutive year we've been doing it. It stretches all the way from San Luis to Texas Hill and even over into Bard. Uh, 16 trap locations, and we trap all the major leps and then a lot of the other species on sticky traps. And we, uh, we provide this data every two weeks in our vegetable IPM updates. So I say that because you may want to pay attention to some of that trapping after we get done talking. Maybe, maybe not. So I'm going to start with seedling and soil pests. I'm going to start with this slide. About seven years ago, we, we put a uh, blacklight trap right out here in one of our blocks, lettuce blocks, for one night. And this is what we collected in one night. And that's the kind of activity that you don't necessarily see when you're home sleeping or doing whatever. And in particular, you can see just all ty types of crickets, all types of beetles, um, a couple of even Palo Verde borers, which, you know, they're not doing anything. And then, of course, this mass right here. And this mass is, generally speaking, those are the ones that are responsible for a lot of problems at stand establishment, and I'll show you that in a second. You know... This is what a stand should look like for the most part. I wanted to talk about this because last year in September, towards the end of September, I personally saw four blocks of lettuce that were just wiped out. Wiped out. And it turned out they were from beetles. Now, they were organic. That's, that's one thing. And, but the, the point being is that when beetles are in abundance, they can really take out a stand. And, and right when that plant starts to germ and starts to crook, they'll take it out. And I... I you don't see that very often, but for some reason last season in September was really bad, particularly in blocks near where Sudan grass that still hadn't been worked in or had been in Sudan grass or near a drain. Just sources of these beetles. This was, one of, this was the more prominent beetle, and I know it's magnified quite a bit. It looked black for the naked eye looking down at it on the ground. But this is just one of the numerous carabid species that we see out there. Carabids are pretty uh, recognizable by the the jaws, the mandibles, the big mandibles. Again, this, this, this thing is pretty small. They are predaceous. The adults are, they'll find, they'll eat on a lot of different insects that are out there, but they're also seed feeders. And they will eat on newly germinating seed right when it's starting to imbibe water and the split coat splits. A lot of times they'll get in there and get that. That was the predominant species. Another species we see, and this was one that came out of that same Two of those blocks were staphylids. You know, they're characteristic. They look like little earwigs, much smaller. They've got the half elytra. This is actually a modified forewing. They do actually have hind wings. They can actually fly. They're not very good because their wings are so small. But this is really characteristic. They're very, very small. And again, normally they're predaceous. But you get them with a field, you know, 10,000 seeds in an acre, um, and they're hungry, they'll probably take it out. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the ones you worry about that first 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours when that, that crop is extremely susceptible to beetles like that. Obviously, the next one are crickets. We all know what crickets look like. You know, they, they generally hit the plant once the cotyledons have emerged and they're starting to grow. This is the normal what we call field cricket, and then these are these Indian mill crickets that, that you see. I took this in one of my traps, that trap network. This was out in Welton on 30... This is about, no, this is about 27E. Um, I have a trap, and every time I open it up, it's full of crickets. Now, that was always remaining. There were about 30 crickets in there, and they just took off. So what are they doing in my trap? They're not being, they're not attracted by the pheromone. They're eating all the beet armyworm that were in there. So they are predaceous as well, but they love to eat plants. And so keep an eye on these. Most of you guys are, may know that. That's a no-brainer. What's the, what's the, you know, again, preaching to the choir. Chemigation is standard, particularly for that series. You can get darkling beetles sometimes that will come in. Um, generally, at the end of the set, that, that first set of water, this is what we do on, on, on the experiment station. We run them for 48 hours. That first, last half hour in that set, we put the pyrethroid out, sterilizes the soil, sterilizes the soil, and we don't have problems with beetles for the most part, or crickets. Sometimes you may have to come in with an additional one if you have a lot of outside 
pressure coming in. Um, that's for the most part. Um, we do have some data on this. I'm going to show you some graphs like this. This one here is the percentage of lettuce acres that were actually chemigated. This is over 18 years. This is from 2004 to last fall 2021. And you can see it's been fairly up and down over the years. But on, on, on track, about 60% of the lettuce acres get chemigated. Most of those are probably September and the first half of October, maybe 100% during that period. If you look at the number of chemigations, on average, it's about 1.2 chemigations. Last two years, they've been relatively low. And again, this is, this is over, um, when we do these surveys, this is 20 to 30 different PCAs that are watching ground over the entire area, including Perio Valley, that are giving us data. That's why you see fluctuations from year to year. But I'd say about 1 to 1.2 chemigations per per crop. So that's kind of stand establishment in a review format. One more I want to talk about quickly. Well, actually, two more. That, that is, there are alternatives. So once that plants, once the pipe's pulled, you got your, your fields are lined out, you got plants, you got to stand established. Oftentimes, we used to worry a lot about Bagrata bug. It's kind of disappeared. It occasionally shows up. And certainly, pill striped flea beetles, which they're everywhere. And it just depends on where you're at. If you're near alfalfa, or cotton, those, those can be some bad spots. One of the nice things about that is there is a real effective seed treatment available. Some of you, uh, some of your growers may or may not use it. Nips it, it's a neonicotinoid treated lettuce and broccoli seed, works very effective. Predominantly against Bagrata and flea beetle. You'll get 14, easily 14 days control from the minute it emerges and puts about two, maybe three, sometimes four leaves on. First question. If you miss this one, you need to go back to school. So, <laughs> so just for you in TV land or Zoom land, there's the, the first question. Um, pretty easy, I think. Okay, let's move on to the last, last uh, what I call stand establishment, once you've got a plan established, and that is grasshoppers. You know, it's funny. This graph here, we started collecting data in 2007 for grasshoppers. You can see in 2008, we had I would consider almost an outbreak. 60% um, of the acres were sprayed for grasshoppers that particular season. We've had a couple of instances here in 12 and 14. You can see the last couple of years, they're kind of just there. Um, I thought, and I, it's funny, we've been talking about this with guys all summer, and I've had several people tell me, well, you know, grasshoppers are always bad. And I used to kind of think this too, when we have heavy monsoon, and certainly we're having heavy monsoon. We've had here at this Ag Center almost two inches of rain since August 1st. You go out, you go out east to Texas Hill and there, and it's, it's got to be more than that. And I did the data. I, wouldn't, I compared this, and I should have showed it, but bottom line is there's no, there's no clear, clear cut association with heavy monsoons and high numbers. And in fact, this one did have heavy monsoon. These two did not. So maybe under extremely high, so don't, don't bank specifically on a heavy monsoon to predict grasshoppers. I gave up predicting the insects a long time ago, but I would still keep my eyes open for grasshoppers because you do see them. I, I've been seeing them around more and more. I've uh, been seeing them in my backyard of all places. So keep an eye. And again, same thing. Uh, I will say this. Traditionally, it's been lanate, pyrethroid. You have to keep coming back because they keep on moving in. I've got colleagues in Florida and another colleague up in Oklahoma who deal with crickets in the grasslands, or crickets, but uh, grasshoppers. And they tell me the product that works best is Corrigin or Besiege, the chlorantronilaprol. So it has very good activity on grasshoppers. So keep that in the back of your mind if you get in a situation where you've got to control them, and particularly if you have worms as well. Okay, let's transition over to now you've got a plant, you're probably thinning or pretty close to thinning stage, and all of a sudden, of course, armyworm. That is by far the number one pest we deal with statistically from the surveys. And certainly, uh, I've been doing this for over three decades. I love to say three decades. And it's no doubt that this pest, year in and year out, is the one pest you can depend on to be there and be destructive, uh, particularly at stand establishment. Um, whether it's you know just 11 days out of the ground, as opposed to a thinning stage. You know, it's obviously there, again, preaching to the choir. Um, here's some trapping data. Here we are right here. We're here in August. And we're tracking right now about where we normally track. There, you go out and you check these traps 
the last month or so, and there's hardly any things in the, bu in the buckets, these pheromone traps. But what happens is starting, when the lettuce starts going in the ground next week, all of a sudden we start getting peaks. And this is peak activity. And then we see this gradual movement. These years have been pretty good. Now, I point out fall of 2020. That was not last season, but the, the fall before. And I point it out because you can see it was so much higher than the others. Now, I'm going to say right up front, I would never make a management recommendation, spray recommendation, based on a pheromone count. But well, what I've seen over the years is there's a pretty good association between what we're seeing in our traps and what you guys typically see in the field. So let me, let me, let me follow that up. Here's that data in terms of armyworm. Obviously, it's pretty obvious that it's an important pest because over the, uh, the last 50, 18 years, over 95% of the acres get treated for armyworm, and on average, about three times. That's how important that pest is, and that's how critical it is to management. You can see that 20, 2020, year before last, we saw a little increase last year, not so much. Why do I point this out? In 20, the fall of 2020, I took a major hit from beet armyworm. Those traps were, were, were going crazy, and this was in October, planted September 5th, this is about 30 days after planting. You can see my guard rows are gone, my untreated check's gone. The only thing that's remaining is anything I sprayed with various treatments in this trial. So that's how heavy that pressure was in 2020 relative to some of the previous years. The last time I saw pressure like this was many moons ago when we were doing a lot of uh, work on this farm, the old farm here. So again, I think you might want to keep an eye on those traps, especially when you start picking up an army worm early in the next week or two, and you see those traps in our updates are up there, might give you an indication that you might be in for a, for a hard fall. If they're low, that could be a good sign that it's going to be easy. But still no substitute for boots on the ground when it comes to making management decisions. Second question. Beet armyworm is primarily a pest in fall lettuce. Should be a dead giveaway. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, again, I think it's another easy one. Now, cabbage looper is the complementary pest that often occurs sometimes at the same time during the season. Oftentimes it does, but it's, it, it never shows up as early in September like it does. And again, I'll, I'll, you know, again, it's not necessarily a seedling pest, although there have been times I've seen it on pre-thinned lettuce. It's pretty rare um, in Yuma uh, on, on the early plantings, maybe when you get a little bit later into, the, into October. But typically it's more of a mid-season, and certainly when you get to harvest, it can contaminate product pretty easily. This is some pheromone counts. Um, you can see this is over the last three years. We were do I've been doing these area-wide traps for 10 years. But for the first seven, I just focused from September to April, just during the produce season. I thought, you know what? We're really missing something here. We should be looking throughout the entire year. So the last three years, we've, we've gone full cycle year-round. I think it's been helpful. Here we are here. You can't find a cabbage looper out there right now. They're extremely low. The last three years, they don't start showing up until early October, at least the moth's starting to move, because that's what you're actually measuring when you're looking at these traps. And then, of course, you typically do get some, in the late spring, you get activity. But look at last year. Almost no moth captures throughout the course of that last season. And when you look at it compared to the 10 years average, now this is only during the produce season. This is from August to the end of March, but you can see when they typically start to peak, it is about early October, on average, across the last 10, 9 to 10 years. Last year, there was hardly any activity, and you can say that for the, these three here. So I don't know why that is, but the fact was that we didn't see looper movement in terms of moths as we've seen in years, years past. And again, it just illustrates that it's that October window, about you know, three to four week delay in terms of peaks from beet armyworm. So in other words, when you get into October, you're, you're usually battling both species. Um, when you look at the actual percentage of the acreage that required treatment, you can see the last couple years it's gone down to where on average it's about 80 when you take into effect some of the old, old previous years. Now, the last two years, we're right about 50% of the acres. Now, oftentimes you're treating for both species, right? But when, you're, when we ask these questions, what were you specifically spraying for? 
you can see it's about 50%. And the number of sprays actually went down when you're targeting specifically for cabbage looper. And again, could it be the hay market was, was high last year? I, I don't know. Could it be cotton defoliated? I, I don't know. Uh, but something changed in the last couple of years when it came to looper and certainly with armyworm last year. So what does that mean? Uh, treatment's always required. I'm not going to show you a bunch of data. I'm just going to show you this is our recommendations. The big three classes, Radiant, Proclaim, and then a group of diamide insecticides. There's uh, basically six to choose from that, uh, again, remember, just like Marco was saying, they're the same mode of action, same chemistry. You want to treat these as a single product to rotate with others, and then you've got some other products at, at any given point in the season that you you feel will work for you. You know, these two here are intrepid, as you, may, as you all know, and Avant, are effective mainly through ingestion. There's no translaminar activity on the leaf. So they're, they're best used when the plant's got some size to it, and certainly pre-harvest, because you don't want to mess around when you're a couple weeks to harvest. So they've got to fit more towards the middle of the plant when you can afford a little bit of chewing on, on the plant. So that's, that's, uh, that's the DLEPS in terms of armyworm and looper. I'm not going to say much about corn earworm. It's, it's so sporadic, but it's one of those deals come about the third week in October. You better be spraying something preventatively, especially if you're out in Dome Valley, preventatively to uh, make sure that they don't sneak in on you. And then there's diamondback. Um, we don't really have a big history with diamond, diamondback moth. A couple years ago, we had some issues in 2016. I haven't done any surveying lately. We did, uh, for four or five years, we were doing pretty consistent surveying to PCAs. The same time we were doing the lettuce insect losses, we were asking them about, uh, about diamondback. And basically, this is a five-year period from 2016 when we had the outbreak. And, it, and all, every, all, every year since then, what you see is that this is... Um, the acres where diamondback were considered problematic, basically where I'm going to have to really treat aggressively if I'm going to prevent uh, harvest losses. You can see it was about over 50% in 2016, 50% of all the coal crop acres we surveyed, and now it's well below 5% on average. So it's really back to where it was previous. It's more of a secondary pest, heck, maybe even a tertiary pest. So why do I bring it up? Well, there's an interesting story behind that. We've been trapping that thing for, uh, what is it, six years now. When, right when the outbreak began, we started trapping. And these were the kind of adult numbers we were seeing associated with those populations area-wide. And then, you know, you can see they dramatically dropped off. And then the years since then, they've been pretty light. I mean, relatively 50 to 75% lower than what we saw in the outbreak year. But this is the catch right here, right there from about July 1 to about right now. Basically, we don't have any diamondback. We don't catch diamondback. And the reason is, is that diamondbacks is very, very specific for brassica crops. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, they're selective. They don't really go to anything else. We don't have any of those available during the summer, not even weeds. It's so damn dry. So we got this going on here, which brings me to my third question. Diamondback presents are not present in the desert, true or false? So the question at this point is, what's going on here? Why all of a sudden, after this long, hot summer of no diamondback, do we start seeing numbers pick up and, and the population is essentially reestablishing themselves in the desert? Well, that happens one of two ways, or both, actually. What essentially happens is, and this is, this is not anything... This is not unusual to the desert. Um, all over the world, the diamondback are known to migrate thousands of miles, literally thousands of miles, not at one time, but over a series of time. And so what happens is, and we've, we've tracked this through our trapping research over the years, is that when storms come blowing in, they will bring diamondback with them, particularly where they're coming from. Not so much with the monsoons. In fact, we've had quite a few monsoon storms coming coming out of the southeast, right? The last, what, the last 30 days. And my traps haven't spiked a single time. I haven't found any diamondback since last May and June. So what these storms are bringing aren't bringing any diamondback so far. 
But our previous research efforts have showed us that we typically pick up a lot of diamondback following the storms that come out, come from those, those hurricanes that come from Baja, uh, Hurricane Nora, Hurricane Glenda, whatever they are, they come up, what they do is they just come up usually from either coastal or on the Baja or the continental side, Sonora, they'll come up, come right up the uh, thing as, as a hurricane, usually down south. By the time they hit Yuma, they're maybe a tropical depression, maybe whatever they call that, and the winds are like maybe 30 miles an hour, and as those winds start to peter out, what happens to those diamondback? They drop, and that's what we've seen a couple of occasions based on wind patterns. And again, that's been documented all over the world that they'll move. How do you think they get into Canada, the canola up in Canada? They don't overwinter up there, it's too cold. They come up out of Texas on, on, on storms. Same, same principle, same principle. The other way is they come in on transplants. And it happens all the time. INSV, we have determined that INSV comes in on transplants. We've seen aphids. A lot of things come in on transplants. Um, and that's, not been, that's, that's been well documented. Same thing up in upstate New York. They grow a lot of cabbage in New York. Diamondback don't survive the, sun, the winters there. It's too cold. But they bring transplants in from Florida and Georgia. And so they bring them up and they come loaded with diamondback. So that, again, nothing new. It's just something that when, we, when these, these transplants start coming in from coastal California, if they have diamondback on them, you know, that's one of the ways they get in here. So paraphrasing Forrest Gump, you know, they're like a, diamondback's like a box of, like a box of chocolates. We just don't know what we're going to get on any given year. You really never know the diamondback that you have, whether it's coming in from the wind, from the south, or maybe it's coming in from the coast. You just don't know. So you have to plan accordingly and be, be on top of your game when they do show up. Our recommendations basically are this. They haven't really changed. Proclaim, Radiant, Exorel, Harventa, the diamides, the same type of products we use for most LEPs. Rotate those modes of action. That's critical because this thing can turn a generation in less than two weeks. So you don't want to overexpose more than one generation, much like Marco was saying. And don't, mix, don't be tank mixing these products. You don't need it. These uh, single product will do the job. There's no question. And then finally, with besiege and my recommendation is because I've been testing populations coming out of California, out of Salinas, out of Santa Maria, and out of Camarillo. If they've come, if you find diamondback and those transplants have come from coastal California, avoid using besiege and corrigin because we've documented risk resistance to this mode of action to those populations. Now, that, that'll probably change in the future. Let's hope it changes in the future. But at this point, you know, use something else. Use another alternative in that particular case. So that's, that's diamondback moth. Uh, again, secondary pest hasn't really been a pest, but you never know. Then, of course, there's always Verimark plant transplant, transplant drench. Works wonderful. You get 30 days. At least here in the desert, we see 30 solid days of LEP control, including diamondback. Um, if, the, if the nursery puts it on correctly, uh, you'll, get, you'll, get a, you'll get excellent control. And in most of the cases, I've talked to several guys uh, that have transplants in the ground right now, and they say all their stuff has Verimark on it, and it's clean as a whistle, as it should be, as it should be. The other advantage, and it's costly, it's not cheap. I think you guys know it's not cheap. But the other advantage of having that is that it controls Wi-Fi. It's an excellent Wi-Fi material, whether it be as a transplant drench or, or in the soil, shanked in like we do everything. Here's this data. Here's trap data. They peak twice a year. This time of the year, obviously, they're coming off of cotton. They're coming out of hay. And then again, they'll peak uh, in the summer after the fall melons. Seems like they peak when the fall melons get dissed under, and then they go down to where we're at right now. There's not a lot of movement, but they will be moving here pretty quickly, no question about it. In terms of the lettuce acre sprayed, it's very low. On average, it's about 40. Last couple of years, it's been less 20, 15 to 20 percent of the acres require a spray for Wi-Fi. And you can see it's, it's on the average about one to one and a half, one point two sprays. Compared to back in the day in the 90s, if any of you were around then, uh, that's pretty dramatic for a fall crop. But there's an easy explanation for it, and a lot of it is. A lot of our acres are treated with imidacloprid. They're still using the high top of the label rate of imidacloprid, and it still seems to be providing fairly decent efficacy in some cases, in most cases, and you still get good efficacy. 
and you do have options, although in this case you can see it's very low, you have options to come over the top. Now that's lettuce. Brassicas, particularly broccoli and cauliflower, that's a different story. If you look at the pecking order of white flies, primarily they like what? They like melons. Secondary, they like coal crops. And then third, they like lettuce. So if there's any coal crops around, or melons, they're going to they're go to those crops before they'll go to, to a lettuce. So here's a little bit different. We do see from, from year to year some heavier numbers. But again, you've got a very, uh, very large list of products to come over the top or in the soil to control both adults and, and both nymphs. Um, and again, I just list them as first choices, second choices. So again, there's no, no excuse for not being able to control um, whitefly on these brassica crops. Um, I didn't say it was cheap. I just said it's, it, can, it can easily be done. And then finally, I'm going to finish up here with Western flower thrips. You know, for years, we worried about the cosmetic injury. But of course, now, um, INSV is always a threat in the back of a lot of people's minds. Uh, you know, we, we typically think of Western flower thrips as a spring pest. And it is. It's much more abundant and more damaging in the spring on our spring lettuce crops, particularly towards the tail end. But the last few years, we've seen where it's really built up uh, to be a fall, a, fall, uh, a fall pest as well, particularly because of the cosmetic injury that it can cause. This is just trapping. This is that year-round trapping we've been doing the last three years. We see two peaks. We see an, over, we see an early fall peak, and then we see this massive peak um, at the tail end of the produce season. And so again, it's much higher here as the temperatures really start to build as we go into the summer, um, those two peaks. What I want to show you now is what's going on during the produce season from September to March. And what we see there is we did a bunch of trapping last year. This yellow line is what I just showed you. That's, that's the area-wide traps, and those are spaced next to cotton. They're just spaced. We specifically put traps next to lettuce and specifically put traps to melons. And voila, we can see where the thrips are probably coming from in many cases on our, our fall lettuce crops. Melons is a big one. You get a peak early, and then you get this peak at harvest. And you get the same thing when they're coming off or coming into, probably coming into, into lettuce. What we didn't do, and which we're, we're, we've started this year to try to complement this, is we got traps next to alfalfa, because I really think alfalfa is one of the culprits too, because it's the biggest magnet of them all. When you look at it just where they're at. Um, so I got a feeling that alfalfa, and I could be wrong, but I got a feeling alfalfa is going to be up here next year. Nonetheless, we got a pretty good sense of where these strips are moving around and where they're coming from. Again, you know, when we first started tracking thrips back in 18 years ago, there were, again, fall wasn't a big deal, but the last few years, we saw the steady increase in the percentage of acres that PCAs were spraying. And again, I don't know if that's quality standards, that's a shipper deal, I'm not sure. And then it dropped down, but then last year it, it jumped up again, and I think a lot of this had to do is because of preventative measures for INSV. Same with the number of sprays. On average, it's a little bit less than two, but you can see the last few years we've seen um, above average, if you will, above this average, right around two applications, specifically for thrips in the fall. But of course now we have INSV, and that's a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to go into much of the detail other than we still haven't determined what, how big of a threat it is. At this point, it doesn't seem to be a huge threat, but don't, don't ever know, and, and I'm not going to predict that. Um, but I think in the fall, there's a couple of ways to, to approach this. One of them is, I think if you, because we do, knew, do know that these things are coming in on organic and conventional romaine transplants. We know that. We've documented that. Um, if you've got lettuce transplants, um, you should probably treat them or have the shipper treat them as they come in or before they come in or certainly once they hit the ground just to try to not take the top off of those plants so you don't see a lot of secondary spread. Conversely, if you're in a direct seeded field adjacent to one of these organic ranches or conventional ranches that have Salinas origin, uh, transplants with Salinas origin, you probably should be a little more aggressive on your thrips management in those blocks there. Um, and certainly in areas where we found INSV last year, generally it's those same ranches. Bottom line is, to date, it hasn't had a huge impact. INSV hasn't. 
Um, and I think, I, I think a lot of it is because some of the PCAs, particularly those that are watching those transplants that are coming in are being very aggressive on those transplants. So time will tell, we'll see. But so far it hasn't been a huge, a huge problem. And then again, here's just a list of products. I think everybody knows this. You've got three ma major products that fit. You've got Torac that's kind of in between, real sensitive to timing, very, very good on smaller plants because you can get good coverage. These other basically just provide suppression. So if you're in a bind and you need something to rotate with, these are the hammers and these are kind of the, the mallets, if you will, something in between um, your, your spray program. And I think that's it. I think I've got one more slide, and that is Stephanie had told you at her, after her talk that we still have a bunch of these uh, INSV immunostrip kits, and she's got a nice uh, cooler out there. So if, I'd say grab some, grab a couple of them, because you just never know when you're going to need, you're going to come across a funky looking plant. Might be, might be a chemical burn, but it'd be nice to know just to make sure. So again, they're free of charge and uh, help yourself. Anybody have any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, John, I have a question. Maybe this is a question for you or maybe for Gary. Um, so a lot of times you said uh, maybe you want to treat your transplants as they're coming to you or right after you put them out. How do you change um, a chemistry formulation, like a mixed formulation, when you're applying it to transplants in a tray? How do you calculate your rates for transplants in a tray versus out in the field, right? The square footage is different. Well, Baramark, the way you, you treat Baramark is pretty simple. I mean, you just have, if you have 10, if you're going to apply 10 acres, right, and you've got 100 trays and your spacing is 11 inches, you can just do the math. So you're treating those trays on individual plants. So you'll use a lot less material. So you're Be using the rate for the field? Absolutely. And not for? Not, yeah, because you may have a, a, a one acre's worth of trays for 20 acres in the field. You're, you're calibrating for this, for the field, the 20 acres. So it's 13.6 ounces. And so you can, you can figure out exactly how much each individual plant should receive. And it's DuPont years ago, and I think it's still available. I've got it if anybody needs it. They put out a right, nice little best management practices that, that has a little chart that you can just fill in the blanks and it'll calculate it all for you. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Well, thank you so much for coming out and talking to us today.